I was recently hired by a church in Dallas to overhaul their sound system. Their building was getting renovated and they wanted to use some of their existing gear as well as purchase some additional gear to make sure that the low end was amazing everywhere. So I came back with the design and I showed them this. They were a little bit confused. I got some raised eyebrows. They'd never seen this before. The Number one, the subs are in the air. The These are dual 18s and they're facing each other. They're not facing forward. Some's behind the other. I also showed them this. In another part of the room, we were going to have four of the single 18 cabinets, but they're going to face forward and pulled even further apart. We don't see this often, and honestly, they were a bit hesitant. Understandably so. They just hired some guy they literally just found on YouTube. That's how they found me to design the rig. But thankfully, the, the worship passion music director went to bat for me and said, hey, trust this guy. He, he's shown his work. He's done the math. I think he's going to do a great job for us. So today I want to unpack that entire process of, of handing off a design and, and having an integrator who did a stand-up job integrating it, who maybe has some questions, had never seen it before, but ultimately they trusted me and we got great results. So we're going to unpack how this particular set of sub woofers work, why I deployed this way, the challenges it came up against, and I'm really excited about this one. If you would like to get better results out of your sound systems, be able to predict in advance and know for sure that the physics are on your side of what you're designing, I think you would love my audio math survival spreadsheet. I got that here and it's at, available at producedbymkc.com slash audio toolkit or at the link below. One I use later on in this video is the inline gradient sub array planner. Basically you plug in your crossover frequency of your sub and it's gonna tell you the max summation frequency, basically the 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 frequency that's going to get the most boost from this particular setup, how far to place your rear sub for that, and then the rear sub delay value. I've got another video on the channel that walks you through that recipe of this cardioid subarray, but even if you are not that advanced yet at getting to that, there's something in here for you to make more sense of decibels, how frequency and wavelength are interrelated, so definitely check that out at the link below. Let's jump in. Here's our roadmap for today. We're gonna to first talk about the project scope. What is the context in which I had to deploy these funny looking subarrays? Number two, the four big challenges I had to overcome from this specific system design. And third, I will jump through the system design itself and the, the, the building blocks I put together to get the subarrays to do what I wanted them to do. Number four, we'll look at the measurement data from the field. Could I actually verify in SMART that this actually worked and did it actually sound good and was my client happy? And number five, the key takeaways, both from a system tech, pure raw data skills standpoint and also a people skills standpoint. Let's jump right in. Project scope. So this was a church renovation down in Dallas and they want to repurpose as much gear as they have. They already own six passive VRX 932LA1s and they had some fly bars and they had four passive SRX 728S dual 18 inch subs. So four dual 18s, that's a lot of low end and they had appropriate amplifiers to go with them. And they also just purchased six active VRX 932LAPs and four active VRX 918SPs, single 18s. So I had for subwoofer specifically four dual 18s and four single 18s. And I also had, had to do four hangs of three VRX, two active hangs and two passive hangs. Now I'll cover the main stuff in a later video. They have struggled with clarity in the room. It's a huge room as you will see, it's very reflective and low end punch. They really just feel like their current subs aren't delivering. They were on the floor on the left and the right of the stage. And I'm handling this system design and I'm managing a integrator installer remotely. His name was Joe. He slayed it. Uh, he did such a fantastic job. I basically gave him a plan saying, hey, put these speakers exactly where I want them, run them this way from the processor, have them at these settings. And then I come in uh, on a pretty tight timeline and tune it and have it ready. And so he had it ready to my spec. We had to shift a couple of things around because construction stuff and code and all that. But he did a really good job executing that. And I was supposed to do the design, he handled execution, and then I come at the end and tune and make sure everything was working. So this is the room. It was 222 feet wide, which is which is crazy. And uh, I forget the depth, but it's close to that. And we have the, the stage right here. The subs were at a stack right here and right here. And the nice thing is that they had found me from my YouTube channel, saw, ha saw I had a bunch of videos on subwoofers and trusted me and said, hey, do, do whatever you need to do to get the results that you want. So that was cool to have free reign and here we are. 
So here were the four big challenges I ran up against. So it's a, like I said, it's a very live and boomy room, but they want deep sub bass. They really want it to hit hard. So here's a picture of the room from stage after we had everything in the air. And as you can see, yes, it's big. It's big, tall ceilings. And as of right now, there's no acoustic treatment on these side walls or the rear wall and or the wall behind the stage. So we wanna make sure and keep stuff off the walls as much as we can. There's also a wide main space and a narrow rear tunnel. As you saw earlier, this is seating here in this main space, but they also do just like some weird code stuff how to actually make this these separate rooms, but they have this still available for seating. So I need to make sure I have something wide that covers here and then something narrow that covers there. And then the mix position was under the relay speaker location. So right here is mix. <laughs> and you see one of the sub arrays ended up deploying is above his head and, and this relay speaker that handled the back right here. So we had a, a hang right here that handled this portion and then three hangs that handled right here going out onto these audience sections. So I didn't want him or whoever would be mixing on any given Sunday to have all this bleed and, and low and coming down. And so I really need to make sure I can control the pattern and have it for just the audience ahead of him. And, and this is a look down the tunnel here. And so we had a, a long way to go with this subarray. And then this one is here later on covering these folks. And and it's right here is mixed position. It's a remote project management and a tight schedule. So more or less, uh, it's a very competent integrator, but the rig needs to be done when I come in and tune. We did not have time when I came down to pull down subs and pull a different spot. He already had his team pull cable and power and run them to the processor. So we simply did not have time to change the plan once I got done there. So there was not a trial run. So it has to work the first time. All right, so what was my system design process? So the question that sat in the front of mind the, the whole time is how can I control low frequencies and also make it even and powerful because they really want the subs to hit hard. So first instinct was go with some type of cardioid subarray and that means at least keep energy off the rear wall. So it going from the sub, hitting the rear wall and bouncing back since subs natively uh, have a a basically a omnidirectional response, I need to control that pattern. So this is a two element inline gradient array at 63 Hertz. I have a whole video stepping you through step by step how to make this recipe to get this sub array. So just go to my channel and look for inline gradient or cardioid sub array and you will find it. But more or less, it's one in right in front of the other, both facing forward. The rear one is offset by distance. You add some delay time to it and you add a polarity inversion to make this pattern. So it's really cool. I use this one all the time. So I said, okay, I will use some sort of gradient or I use, I use this inline gradient pattern, but I also wanted to make sure I could fly the subs and I got approval and we had it up above the steel and that would reduce the range ratio. So this helped make it even because subs on the floor, the front row gets pummeled and the back row doesn't feel any punch or else people in the front row die if you had it <laughs> loud enough for the back. So by getting it up high right here, I reduced the range ratio, meaning the difference between the, the, the propagation path to the front row versus the back row. And so that helped get even tonality. And I was also thinking, how can I make a wide pattern for the main space, but a narrow pattern for the tunnel? And so I thought I can subdivide and conquer. You've heard me say this a thousand times. So I want to make a wide pattern with my inline gradient array. And just so happens I had four dual 18s. So how about I put them like this? I had them all facing each other and then have um, it in an inline gradient setup. And why do I have them facing each other? That's because that puts their acoustic centers right close together, because we know if we have two sound sources coming from the same point in space, they're gonna keep a omnidirectional pattern or maintain their point source. But if I pull them apart, they're gonna get narrow. And this prediction specifically at 80 Hertz, because that was the crossover for my sub. So that's why I really care about getting the pattern right, because the lower in frequency, it's gonna be wide anyway. If we move up in frequency, it's gonna get narrower anyway. So my, my crossover is where I care. 
So you can go to my Audio Mass Survival spreadsheet and put in your crossover. It'll actually tell you where it's gonna have the maximum amount of summation in inline gradient setup. And it'll also tell you the distance to displace the rear sub. And that's shown here in this graphic. I handed this to the integrator. The yes, I want all four of my dual 18s and I hear the little drivers and it's facing in. And from the center of this cabinet to the center of this cabinet is five foot two inches and then it's facing out and then projecting towards the wide audience. And that is what it looked like in the air. And here's its, uh, the orientation is it's facing out this way towards the audience. I originally had it behind this VRX array, but some lighting stuff got in the way, so we moved it out to the room and it still worked really nice. And we'll see that data a little bit later. Now I thought, okay, I want to do a relay array, basically where the subs hand off to the other relay hang of the VRX and hang it right behind it and I have single 18s and I pulled them apart. So it's a three foot spacing right here between each sub, but it's five feet total from driver to driver. In hindsight, I might even gone a little bit wider, but since this, the subs were boosted so much at the end of the day, even though my crossover was 80 Hertz, it was definitely well represented at 100 Hertz, 100 hertz as well. So, so yeah, it was kind of 61 and a half dozen the other. But that's how I deployed the, the relay inline gradient subarray. As I pulled them apart, we can see that it narrowed. So this is a narrow pattern four element inline gradient, and this is showing it at 80 hertz. So let's compare it to our previous one that's nice and wide to cover a nice wide area. And I want to get to the tunnel. I don't want it all bouncing off the wall, so I narrowed it up. And this is what it looked like in the air. So what was the combined response when I was doing predictions in Ease Focus 3? And this was it. I had these, these four right here, the passive subarray, the dual 18s, and I had the active right here. And this was what I was able to get. And I was very happy with how even it was. People down front aren't getting hammered, but it's nice and full. They're close to the array. And I was able to keep energy off the walls. And then also was really cool is that front of house really is is still within the green and green uh, in ease focus 3 you could put it in a mode where that means it's plus or minus 3 db within the green so the vast majority of the audience is within that and front of house is not getting any extra energy off the subarray because i've narrowed the pattern it's rejecting in the rear and spacing them out narrows the pattern so that's an inverse relationship the closer you have two subs together the more omni or or more like a circle, <laughs> the, the coverage is going to be, if you start to pull them apart up to a half wavelength spacing at a given frequency, it's gonna get narrow. Once you get beyond that is when you start to get comb filtering and power alleys and such. All right, so here is the measurement data. Can I show you, did it actually work? So you're gonna see the full range measurement of the, the VRX as well as the subs. Again, I'll do a video later on the VRX, but in the following traces, you're gonna see A, B, C of, of three microphones I set out. And this is the front, middle, and back of the main audience area. And that is coming from this, I know it's hard to see in, the, in this picture, but this is our center VRX array. And then it has another one down here and another one uh, to the left. So this is my measurement data. So this is the trace normalization in Smart is off. This is just as is with the microphones. And I was really happy with how closely they tracked. And you can see this is a nice hefty low end rise above 1K. The, the, that trace was 24 dB above 1K. So that's a pretty nice pink shift there, but that's how low end, that, that's how they wanted the low end to be super powerful. And, and, and there we are. It, uh, so I'm, I'm happy with how even the response was front to back and also how the VRX, I was able to get a nice even response. So let's look at another uh, triad of traces. And so Mike C was here in the middle of the main zone, B was at front of house, and A was in the middle of the tunnel. And showing you an overhead view, Mike C right in the middle, B at front of house, and A uh, about 75% back of the audience in the tunnel. And again, no trace normalization. These are the, the is, you're hearing the relay hang in the back tunnel, the center VRX, or I guess all of them are on. All the speakers are on in the room. And these are the traces we had. And I, I was really happy with how the trace is shaped up. This is my, the white trace is the target trace I stole from Michael Lawrence. Thanks again for that. So I'm not surprised that we see this little bump here down here in the low end because 
microphone C was closest to that subarray, but front of house and the tunnel, and if you move off to the sides of the audience, all really track similarly here, and I'm happy with how this was done. And at the end of the day, this is, we're in the service business, is did my client love it? And yes, he played several of his favorite tunes. He brought the drummer in there, got the kick drum going, and he was smiling a ton. He loved it. And so uh, they were fantastic to work with and uh, hopefully be working on some later projects in other parts of the, of the building. But I will say, I know he, along with some other staff, like he did a really good job fighting for me because people would look up these subs, number one in the air and number two in this funny thing. And like, I've never seen this before, but we trust this guy. So uh, I appreciate them trusting me and getting them good results. So here were the key takeaways from this project. Four kilohertz is important, but it's not everything. And why I say that is 4K is a common frequency to look at in prediction software if you're trying to look at coverage. And it is important. It's right in the middle of the human hearing range where we kind of pay attention to stuff. It, you know, when you go, it gets your attention. And 4K can be harsh if it's overwhelming. So it just, it's a very uh, triggering frequency, if you will, but it's not everything. We. Vocal intelligibility is important, but I want to get as many frequencies even throughout the audience as possible. So sometimes that's matching my high frequency coverage to my low end, not vice versa. Number two, your client sees your rig before they hear it. So if you're on a different show or having to do something funny, even with your main speakers or make a constant curvature array do weird things, they're gonna look at it and be like, wait a minute, what, what's going on here? Does this person know what they're doing? And which brings me to my, my last point is build trust early and show your work. How I've been able to build trust with this client is them watching my, my YouTube channel and I try to do my best to show exactly what I'm doing, what's the math that's, that's under it and admit when I make mistakes or don't understand something. So always build trust with your clients. Um, if they have to go to someone higher up in an organization, whether it's a business or a church or even a production circle, they will go to bat for you if you've shown your work They've heard, they've heard your results before and that they can get it even if you have to do something funny that doesn't look right to get the results. Okay, now Michael Curtis, thank you so much for hanging with me. I hope this was helpful for you and you can start thinking about low end a little bit differently. That's something that you can shape and not just you know throw subs in front of the stage and have a good day. Sometimes that's the right move, but make sure and check out my Audio Mass Survival Spreadsheet at the link below and I'll catch you next time. Thanks.